Our group has been spending quite a few years trying to look at differences between uh, major depressive disorder and ME. Um, to put it real briefly, um, if you had a person with a major depressive disorder and said, tomorrow, if you were well, what would you do? The person with major depressive disorder would say, I don't know. Um, if you ask the same question to a person who suffers from ME, they'd start compiling a list of things that they've wanted to do but have been able to because they've been sick. So there's an issue of really self-reproach. Um, people with ME don't have kind of negative personal feelings about themselves. People with major depressive disorder do have that type of negative feelings about themselves. So self-reproach, kind of expectations for the future, and also exercise. People with major depressive disorder often feel better with exercising. And we know that with people with ME, exercise often induces post-exertional malaise. So there are clear differences between these two illnesses, and they have to be differentiated. There are a number of studies that have actually found physical differences as well, biological differences between people with major depressive disorders and ME. So for example, cortisol levels. Um, generally, they tend to be kind of lower in people with ME and higher with people with major depressive disorder. You know, if you ask the right questions, even with self-report questionnaires, one of our doctoral students was able to do 100% discrimination between two groups if you get it right. So that's why questionnaire development is so important, because if you ask the right questions, you can really discriminate people from these different illnesses, which is critically important for the research that we and others do. The best research really looks at things from a multi-dimensional perspective using multiple disciplines. So for example, you want self-report questionnaires to be brief so that you can find out what the basic symptoms are the person has. But then you want to follow it up with the physical examination so that you can rule out other illnesses. If a person has lupus or MS, you want to rule them out. But you also want to have challenges. So for example, putting a person on an exercise challenge with a max or submax test, and that would basically find out some of the genetic markers that might differentiate patients from people who aren't patients. So in a sense, you really want is the best sources of data so that we can really do comprehensive evaluations of self-report and medical domains so that we can better characterize this illness. And if you miss one of these domains, you miss an important area of functioning to really help us understand these people. Besides major depressive disorder, which can be um, confused, and I think often is confused with ME, um, there are other types of psychiatric illnesses that can be confused with ME. Um, so for example, somatization disorder um, is something that has been confused with people who have ME. Um, there's also anxiety disorders that have been confused with people with ME. So yes. Um, I guess what I'm suggesting is just as you go to a physician to get a medical examination, we really need to have, in a sense, structured psychiatric interviews to sort of make sure a person has particular disorders or doesn't have disorders. Because what you want to do is differentiate those people. And physicians, unfortunately, have not been trained to basically do a psychiatric evaluation. So often they don't know if a person has a major depressive disorder or somatization disorder. So you really want to have a comprehensive psychiatric as well as comprehensive medical examination before you determine whether a person has ME because you want to exclude other causes of the person's illness. Every chronic illness has higher rates of people who have depression. So there's no reason that people with ME won't have some depression as well. Not all patients with ME, but some patients will. I mean, just think about it. If you have an illness that a lot of people don't understand, a lot of people don't believe, it's very debilitating, and you basically are often questioned about it, um, those are all reasons to feel discouraged. So in a sense, you might have, in a sense, kind of discouragement and a sense of, you know, 
almost like hopelessness at times, that does occur. Um, and I think we have to understand that that's the same thing that occurs with any types of chronic illness. The depression that occurs with any chronic illness starts with basically the people around that individual legitimizing what they're experiencing. Basically, the support systems around a person have to be examined. And if you have individuals, whether they're parents who don't believe a child is ill, or workers who don't believe the individual is ill, and if you have discouragement and skepticism, that's going to be a deadly type of influence that has to be removed if you're going to begin to treat an individual's sense of hopelessness or despair for being victimized with an illness that's so poorly understood by society. When a person has ME, I think it's important to treat all the symptoms that an individual has. So for example, if they're dealing with pain, there might be some types of medications that are used. If a person's dealing with any other types of symptoms, um, there's all types of medications that should be considered. In a sense, what the patient needs to have is the best team possible that works on the different issues. It might be nutritionist. It might be someone who deals with physical therapy. It might be different issues that the person needs help with, and we should basically have patients empowered to basically put together a treatment team to kind of meet their needs, which are often diverse. And that's the key to success, using both pharmacological and even non-pharmacological interventions to basically come up with a treatment program that basically meets each individual's needs. We don't have a lot of research yet in terms of comparing ME with lots of other conditions. I think we need that type of research because that will help us understand some of the similarities and dissimilarities. An example, um, in terms of MS, um, one of my colleagues, Matthew Sorensen and I, are just finishing a paper that's looking at brain proteins in MS. And we basically have found, for example, that individuals with ME um, tend to have the same level of low brain proteins, called BDNF, um, as people with MS. And that's one of the primary biological markers of MS. And what does BDNF brain protein make? The myelin sheath that allows the electrical impulses to go through the brain. So and again, it's possible that MS and ME has some similarities that we really don't know that much about yet. But I think in the future, we will do more comparative biological research to help us understand this. Heeft u een vraag naar aanleiding van deze video? Reageer op YouTube of tweet naar het MECVS Vereniging of mail naar wvp.me-cvsvereniging.nl. Uw vragen worden zoveel mogelijk behandeld in de chatsessies.